for hackathon projects on the Development Summit uh, webpage. Um, and then we'll kind of have an opportunity at the beginning of tomorrow to like pitch your ideas and s try to get other people interested in them to work on it with you. So um, for the rest of today, um, we're gonna have some presentations and discussions. Um, so the priorities of what I thought, um, what, kind of what I wanted to get out of the discussions today are to give reports of works in progress um, that need people, other people's input on it, um, to gather requirements for future projects. Um, and I think one thing that I'm very interested in, I think a bunch of people have expressed interest in, is a separate open ZFS code repository. Um, so there's a lot of kind of open questions that need to get decided as a group on, you know, what code should be part of it, how should it be managed, how do we get there from here, et cetera. Um, all right. So, do, are there other priorities that people think are kind of missing from this? Um, I know several people have uh, expressed interest in kind of, um, like, uh, I asked Adam to give a talk on uh, ex his experience with like doing ZFS performance evaluation. So this is kind of like a, a, a more um, less interactive talk, but I think it's very interesting for developers as opposed to you know end users may not have the skills to do some of the in-depth analysis that, you know, uh, that we will in room have. So I think that's very, that's very relevant to this audience. So um, now I think we need to figure out, like, what are we going to talk about and what order are we going to talk about it? So here's a bunch of ideas uh, that were on the website. Um, there's two pages here. So I kind of wanted to get, like, a show of hands of what things are most interesting to people? How about other, if people brought other ideas? I want to shout that out. First. Sure, so um, I'll give you a moment just to read these and then um, I will let people uh, Are there other, other ideas that people would like to, did people come with other topics that they're excited to talk about with the rest of the group? Sure. Yeah, so I, I can say multi-tenant ZFS, so basically things that we do at the point that we want to go do to basically deal with the fact that ZFS gets shared by multiple parts of the box. Uh -huh. I think a couple other people had some um, Did I, Boris, did I have, yeah, I had your yeah. story tree thing there. Um, where is, uh, Stephen, did you, were you mentioning that you had some, uh, some ideas? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, just uh, what we do with it, I guess. Okay. Is that you guys know? And yeah. So yeah. Some of this yeah that, I think that's a great point. It just If you're doing interesting stuff with ZFS, I mean, we could have a whole lightning session that people could stand up and just talk about what you're doing. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd, that'd be, be great. Cool. Yeah. The testing, the testing one sounds uh, really bad because there is a lot of uh, chatter on our group as well about, like, hey, I tried to do this, and we're like, well, that's dead zero, so maybe not bad. <laughs> Is there a particular problem that you're looking to solve with that? Thing? We can maybe reduce I.O. for stuff like X adders and okay. use a slow block for that. Yeah. It doesn't have to be space. Cool. Okay. Um, what would you for couch? Cool. Right. So maybe um, we can do a show of hands. We can just start with this page. So, um, John Kennedy wrote the ZFS test suite and ported it to the new framework that he wrote, Test Runner, which is now in, in Illumos, right? Yeah. Right, cool. So um, are people interested in talking about not just that test suite, but kind of testing on ZFS in general, and like what we need to, sorry, sorry. I thought there might be a lot of hands there. All right. <laughs> um, is Max here? I, I didn't see him. He uh, probably be running late because he's commuting up from Santa Cruz. Okay. Um, so maybe when Max gets here, he can pitch his idea, which is um, around examining the ZFS on disk format using MDB, which is the <coughs> debugger on Lumos. Um, several people were interested in talking about the interactions with the VM subsystem, in particular on uh, Linux and Mac OS. People, 
Oh, that's totally people are interested. All right. Um, is Carol here? There you go. Scalability issues, like using ZFS on really large memory, large number of disks. You can only scale up to 120 gigs. Yeah, that's what I heard on the mailing list. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe like a lightning talks, you know, five, ten minutes maybe on what people Maybe have lunch. Oh, that's a good idea. Maybe lunch just before, just after, something like that. All right, cool. Um, in X adder performance or other uses of big units. Just a couple. So like extended attributes or like X Yeah, extended attributes. Yeah, it should be T's instead of D's. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I don't know. Who's in X adder? <laughs> Um, okay, cool. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of draw the dividing line. Like maybe these, I think these top ones, I saw lots and lots of hands, and then these, these bottom three, a few less hands. Um, all right. Open ZFS code repository. Um, performance on fragmented pools. George has done a bunch of work in this area. Um, so I know there's been a bunch of interest on both the Linux and the FreeBSD fronts on creating a FMA workalike for handling like spares and stuff like that. Um, I think this is this would be mainly like a discussion session more than a like I don't know that anybody has a pair of talk on this, but uh, is there interest in what is it FMA? Um, it stands for Fault Management Architecture. It's part of uh, Lumos. Um, but it handles like uh, detecting when um, a device or a controller has died, and um, then like taking appropriate actions like uh, bringing in a hot spare. So my understanding is that on these other platforms, there's no kind of automatic hot spare activation. So I think that's kind of the most visible. So it'd be nice to expand that a little bit so that we can talk about spares in general inside ZFS because I think there are issues there for all the platforms. Yeah. Some pretty yes. serious ones, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's um, true. Above and beyond the FMA stuff. All right, cool. Um, was, sorry, I didn't catch the show hands for this. Okay, lots of people. Awesome. Um, so I think we're all interested in talking about like the community, the future of the community. Um, I asked Karen to kind of organize. Uh, I don't know if she escaped for a minute, but um, um, <coughs> I think she needs to leave uh, a little bit earlier. So we scheduled, I scheduled just this one talk for um, after lunch. Um, Matt, maybe we could lead into that with like a, just a panel from porters, from, from people from different um, OS communities to talk about what's hard or easy about the port. Yeah. Um, you know, that might actually make sense as a lead into the open best code repository. Okay, great. Um, so maybe I'll do like a sub bullet there. Um, Uh, I got there. Um, storage tiering. Um, Boris has had a report of what they're doing at um, Nixenta and possibly an announcement I heard. Maybe? Sure, yeah. Yeah, that's more good. Yeah, it's probably a couple of people in the SSDs and the device 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 Performance investigation, do you want to give a little a one sentence um, on what? Yeah, so um, I, I spent a bunch of time with one customer in particular and got a bunch of data that led into um, some of the work that Matt and George and I have done in the last year or so in terms of performance enhancements um, and some of the work that George still has ongoing. So that would be presenting a bunch of the either the raw data or some of the investigations we went through with some examples about how we collected the assets. Everyone, everybody cares about performance. <laughs> um, is, and Max is Max is here, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you, you, you too. Cool. So um, Max and Chris and I have been talking about something called ZFS channel programs, which would allow um, 
allow applications, including like the ZFS command line, to uh, do a bunch of ZFS administrative operations um, more quickly and consistently. So this is like if you're doing ZFS snapshot dash R, or if you want to do new crazy cool stuff like uh, ZFS destroy dash P, which like promotes clone promotes clones as necessary to uh, destroy your file system, or like snapshot and clone and snapshot and clone or whatever. Yeah, any kind of compound operations. Um, snapshot all file systems that don't have this property set on them. Yeah. Um, so, so this is kind of a, a specific thing that's a work almost in progress. Like we, <laughs> it's, it's, in, it's in progress. That started on Saturday. That's true. On Saturday, Chris um, got Lua compiling in the Illumos kernel. So that's a little preview of the craziness that we have in mind. <laughs> um, people are still this. All right, cool. So um, I think so. The one I, I guess if we separate these out from like most, I think there how many talks do we point to? Three. Four, five, six, seven, I all those were. So there's 11 that I saw at least half the people raise their hands, and then three more. So we have about six hours of presentations. So if we stick to a half hour per, per presentation, we can talk about all the things that at least half the people raise their hands for. Um, so I would suggest that we, kind of, that we just do that. Um, does anybody want to make an argument that they, one of these things that less people raise their hands is something that's really important that we want to make sure that we make time for? Brian? <laughs> I don't know how much broader buy-in for some of that stuff that is needed, right? So I'm not sure, like, um, like the VM form. I, that should be talked about, because I think we might be doing stuff that's going to mm -hmm. At least impact the code on Linux. <laughs> We'd like that to go upstream, mm -hmm. um, so we want to do it in a way that's acceptable to everybody. But I don't know that that involves everybody necessarily. It might be a little too nitty gritty. Well, let's you know, let's let's go ahead and throw that in as a. Um, we will try to get to all of these twelve topics in the six hours that we have. So that, how's that sound? Cool. All right, um, and I think. That now we are ahead of schedule, so we will be able to get to all the time. <laughs> scheduled until 10, and it's only 9.38. So, um, does anyone have any kind of time constraints on when they need, to, if anybody needs to leave early, and or should we just kind of go through these more or less in order? I can't go until lunch. Okay, we'll do that after lunch. Um, so why don't we, uh, should we start with maybe porting reports and then segue into open ZFS code repository stuff? Uh, just one thing, maybe we should move the projector a little bit because you're kind of... Yeah, should we? I can see it a little bit. Oh, cool. So you don't like the model, right? <laughs> um, so could I ask someone from each of the communities to kind of give a report. Um, so somebody from Illumos, someone from GSD, someone from uh, Mac OS, and someone from Linux. I would, if nobody volunteers, I'm gonna, uh, you know who, I think the people who are gonna get volunteered know who they are. So Brian, <laughs> um, someone from FreeBSD, I know there's several people with a lot of experience here. Uh, maybe Shin or Justin, you wanna do, Shin? So, um, Let's, oh, sorry, hold on. Let's, yeah, let's, let's, come up here. Get, let's get all the kind of panelists up here and then bring, bring a chair and yeah. then why don't we reorganize and move towards the front of the room? So, so, yeah. Um, Jorgen, I'm going to talk about. And then somebody from Illumos. Um, maybe Chris? You. No, you. Chris and Rob. Yeah, Chris and Rob. Because he does more work. <laughs> you guys are actually doing it. You, know, you, you guys actually interact with the Illumos. No. Oh. Integration yeah. process a lot more than I do. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Why don't you um, formalize the schedule? Barely. Of those guys I know all of Matt's questions. I mean, that may be probably, I'm not making that up. <laughs> no, I don't think we're making that up. Okay. 
There's definitely some stuff. Yeah. All right, cool. So, um, I guess maybe what are the big what are the big questions that we want these guys to answer? I think one is like, um, what is the state of ZFS on your platform? Like, is there a bunch of stuff that um, I guess first of all, how does it, how do, how does it work? Like, is it in the main code base? Um, I think most of us kind of know these general answers, but just let's start with that quickly. Like, um, is it like production quality? Are there people using it? Um, how do you use it? Before you get there, could you introduce them and tell oh, what, what, yeah. what the work is? <laughs> right, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you guys. Um, so uh, Brian Bellendorf um, of LLN, which is a government research agency, um, he actually ported ZFS to Linux. Um, and uh, they're using ZFS on Linux at some of the world's biggest supercomputers. Um, uh, Jurgen Lundman um, is uh, working on the ZFS on Mac OS port. Um, when did you start on it? Uh, February, I think. Okay, so just in less than a year, gone from nothing to um, ZFS there were some working. Previous versions, but yes. Yeah, <laughs> on Mac OS. Yeah. Um, Chris Seiden um, is on the Illumos um, committer, what do we call it? Advisor? Advocates. Advocates? Advocates. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Illumos Advocate, so he deals with a lot of the Illumos process um, and which uh, is all the changes that I make and the other people <laughs> uh, from Delphix make. Um, and Shin um, works on ZFS on FreeBSD uh, for Ag Systems and uh, is, I think, currently the most active kind of person in pulling changes from Illumos into FreeBSD. Yes. Cool. Um, so first, um, why don't I ask each of you to kind of tell, like, what, how is ZFS on your platform um, in just, like, a couple sentences? Okay, ZFS for the Linux um, exists in its own repository in GitHub at the moment. Um, it builds against a lot of different kernels in Linux. It's a kind of a diverse environment. Uh, stability is good. People use it in production. Uh, we use it in production. We depend on it in production. Uh, I know a lot of other people have picked it up too. Um, so there's at least like two or three other companies with, that are represented here that are using ZFS on Linux in their products. Yeah. There are still some gaps on Linux, things that aren't implemented, um, but they're pretty minor. The features that get less use. Um, yeah, that's probably a pretty good summary. Cool question. Right. Do you see any conflict between uh, GDL and CDL? No. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't last long. <laughs> All good. <laughs> All good. All right. Can you comment on that a little more? Why? 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 Uh, should I repeat my question? No, no, no. Why? Not what? Why are we talking about licensing? Well, attorney convention? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Because I'm, I'm interested and like to hear. Okay. I mean, it may, so, I mean, that's why. If you want to, I mean, if we have an attorney here, maybe we should talk to the attorney. But we're, this is we're talking about development, right? Yeah. Right, so, is this enough? Of, so it's like, a common question. Discussion not allowed. No, 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 no. It's, it's just, just, it's just like. It's fine. I get this question a lot. <laughs> it's, okay. it's the first question people ask. Um, there is some debate about whether it's okay or not. I think the there is no debate from pretty much anybody about building it from source. So if you take the two independently and build them both from source, I think that's fine. I think there are differing opinions about whether you can put the two together as a binary and ship it as a product. We believe that's fine. Yep. Other people believe different. So I think you know the, the concern about the license discussing licensing issues here is that it's very easy to rat hole on something that none of us can really do anything about. That's all. Like I think it's totally it's a legitimate question. It's just yeah. Uh, yeah. something that has uh, I think you've dealt with uh, you've dealt with this way more than you have ever wanted to. Yes. <laughs> the good news is the question is <laughs> not Yes. Yeah. Cool. It is true. No, that's that's uh, that's. Yeah. Totally I mean, I, right. I, I I think that like. Because I've gotten that question too, and that question is not as prominent as it used to be. Yeah. So that's, that's, that, yeah, I think the same that's, thing we ported KVM. Yeah. It's common, that's people love. People look at licensing, and the trick is just focus on development since that's what we're actually here for. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, you're going to tell us about the state of ZFS on MacOS. Yeah. Okay. Um, the state is pretty good, and it works. Um, <laughs> Uh, I would say, I mean, I use it on my desktop and it's working okay. 
you will probably encounter the occasional panic. I'm not concerned about the Z uh, CFS data at all, but HFS plus and panics do not mix very well. So that would be my, my <coughs> concern. So if you're okay installing your OS, then you can run it just fine. Um, I based my work on directly from the ZFS and Linux, sorry, ZFS and Linux. On the so we, we accept all pronunciations <laughs> of the last letter of the alphabet. I'll be making a mistake. <laughs> um, my most common question is probably why the Linux version as opposed to all the other versions. Uh -huh. But it, ZFS code itself is kind of platform independent, whereas they had a very nice separation between the Solaris lab, the SDL lab, and the ZFS code itself, and whatever kernel you run it under. And that's what I wanted in the WaterConf setup. So, whereas FreeBSD and Lumos are very uh, integrated building process mm -hmm. that buy a software from Linux. Cool. Um, Chris, do you want to tell them? CFS on Lumos is stable and good. <laughs> <laughs> can you, can you, for people that might not know, probably everyone here knows, but can you just give a little bit of the history of like, what is a Lumos okay. and like how did ZFS get there? Right, so a Lumos is the like open source fork of OpenSolaris <coughs> that was created when uh, Oracle closed the Solaris, de stopped developing Solaris in the open and then there's a bunch of like Nixenta and Delphix and some other joint, some other companies that uh, base products off of it and so a lot of those companies do ZFS development and it goes back into the Illumos core. And I think that's very similar to like the free BSD model of how things work, basically. And in, in, a, in a lot of respect. Oh, in the sense that there's like a core, oh sorry, there's a core repository with user land and a kernel and then that's like independent of all of these different companies and the companies all maintain their own forks where they do their own development and build a product off of it. And then changes get pushed from those companies upstream. Uh, sure. Yeah. So the the part of FreeBSD is mostly uh, product uh, production quality. Um, we started with the the code from OpenSolaris, and then we migrated to uh, to to base on Illumos as our base. Um, and we currently have some some unique features um, that that is not not yet available on. Most like uh, trim support uh, and uh, um, the our loader can can boot from a, a read the um, pool uh, and something like that. Cool. Um, so next question, I think maybe you could tell us like what is the development model like on your platform? So um, how do changes how do changes happen? Like I have. Let's say I have some great idea, I make some changes, um, I want to get it into ZFS on your platform. How does that happen? And then <coughs> kind of what's on all that? platforms. Yes. <laughs> yes, and then also like, you know, where do the changes come from on your platform? Like <coughs> i.e. like are you pulling changes from some other platform primarily? Are you talking, you know, how do you interact with other other communities? Um, is that does that question sort of make sense? I think so. Okay. So at least I'll try and explain what happens on Linux today. Um, so we do all of our work out in the open on GitHub, where we happen to host all of our stuff. So we've got an issue tracker there. And um, basically, we follow the most near as we can. We treat it as upstream and try to stay in sync with them. So what will happen at the moment is you guys will make a change. We're usually a few months behind them. Um, we'll cherry pick the commit from Illumos, review it, make sure it looks sane for Linux. Um, I mean, who's doing that? Who's doing that? Um, so, like cherry picking, and then who's doing the reviewing in that? The good news is that I would say the community on the Linux side has stepped up a lot. Occasionally, we'll get um, lots of people, just random people who see this feature, go into a Lumos and say, "I want that. That's cool." All right. So the, the commit's there, right? So they'll go get it from Lumos. They'll rework it for Linux. They'll test it. They'll open a pull request on GitHub. It's at that point that I pretty much review everything that goes in. But I really want to get more reviewers. So often I'll tap other people to look at a change and make sure it looks sane or test it more broadly. Um, and then assuming everything looks good, we run it through our automated uh, regression testing and whatnot, and it'll get merged into our tree. Um, but basically we don't take things in big chunks from Illumos without, revert, without reviewing and testing and merging everything real carefully, because there are some platform specific differences and we don't want to get bit by that. 
so we lag um, and we don't just bring things in blind. But uh, the good news is a lot of the reporting work now is done by other people in the community who just want stuff. Occasionally I'll see people pop up from other platforms like the FreeBSD side who will say, we made this cool feature on FreeBSD, I'd like to see it in Linux too, here it is. And they'll have reworked it for the Linux side. So it just goes through the normal review and process. What I'd love to see from OpenZFS is a more formalized review process and more eyes on the code as things go in. Um, it feels like every, every platform kind of does their own thing right, right now. I think so on, on Linux right now, are you pretty much the sole code reviewer? I am, I certainly review everything, but I'm not the sole reviewer. Okay. All right. So I, my eyes are on it before it goes from the tree, but I try to find other people who know about the subsystem if I can to look at it before it goes in. Um, and often, one of the nice things about the Linux community is it's pretty, because the tree is on GitHub and it's all built, uh, it's really easy to build against whatever Linux distribution you're using. So it's really easy to tap people in the community. I ask this a lot. Um, here's a patch. It's safe. Go test it, right? Come back. Tell me better or worse. I mean, how did it help your workloads? That kind of stuff. So we get, try to get a lot of feedback from the community before something goes in. And then who, who um, is there a process around like that final commit? Is that just like, you know, you are the one person who signs off on it, or is it like a group of people who can do commits to the actual source space? So right now it's just me, but I'd like to expand it. Um, so I'll sign off on it, and then I've got an automated, automated build infrastructure at Livermore, where I run it through a suite of automated tests on like, I don't know, 20 different Linux distributions. And if somebody builds clean there all, and they all pass, and they all run the regression tests, and nothing fails, we'll merge it in. So I'd love to see more of that kind of automated testing more broadly done mm -hmm. with the test infrastructure that you guys are working on at Delphi, so I'm keenly interested in because I want more test coverage. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brian. Um, Jurgen, can you tell us about like what the development process is on macOS? I know it, yeah. it's a lot simpler than <laughs> it's a lot simpler. So uh, well we're based on GitHub as well. Um uh, created a project and I think maybe two or three committers at the moment, so it's a bit empty, and it's mostly me. Um, now every now and then we basically do a giant merge with upstream Linux, uh, and then spend a couple of days just making sure it actually runs. There has been the occasional times where the merge has Linux specific code in it, but yeah, you know, yeah. it happens, that's fine. We'd like to change to the, uh, the open ZFS repository at some point. But at the moment, it would be nice to have more committers, to be honest. It's, uh, it's pretty much just me. I, I have some help, but more would be nice. So, so is it, uh, are you being asked to do this for your job, that they want back ZFS, or is this a bit of a hobby kind of thing? It was one of those um, spur of the moment decisions, so I may have been drunk. <laughs> um, where I wanted to have ZFS on, on OS X as well. I mean, I'd like to have it on all my platforms. It's kind of a replacement for FAT32, which is the only universal file system, <laughs> and it's terrible. So I decided, and the, the existing uh, versions that were there were either version 8 or the commercial, which I'm not allowed to help with. So I decided to do my own version. That's the only reason I, yeah, it's not got anything to do with work okay. directly. Because Apple was interested in doing it a while ago, right? Oh, well, no, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. If anything, I would argue the changes they've done in the kernel, they're making it harder and harder to be a developer for the Apple kernel. And maybe they don't want this. I don't know. Just a sec. I'll get to you in just a sec. And do you want to comment just briefly on like how your work is related to other ZFS on macOS ports? Because besides the Apple one, there's like um, you know, Zevo, and there's also like another open source. Well, there's uh, there was the Apple, the original Apple, which then became Mac CFS, okay, which is pool version eight. Okay. And then there is Zevo by Don Brady, mm -hmm. um, but that is closed source, and it, they haven't released a new version for quite a while, and they've gone through a C, uh, CFO change, CTO. So I, we don't really expect them to be continuing their product, no, at least that's what it looks like. Uh, whereas the port that I started, I looked at the original Apple work and the Mac ZFS and pretty much built the SPL layer from that because they had the uh, trickery of how you do things in the dark and the kernel as opposed to 
splits. So the SPL layer is from the original Max EFS layer, okay. whereas the ZFS code base is from Linux and FreeBSD. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. So the Mac OS last time we worked on it has a little more ESD like EFS. So what 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 drove the Linux? to follow Linux, like, so there had to be something else. So uh, I touched on a little bit in the beginning, but oh, um, no, no, that's fine. Uh, basically, I wanted the separation <laughs> that Linux had between uh, the kernel, the Solaris porting layer, and then the ZFS. And they've got a really beautiful drawn lines where oh, okay. between the, the projects, whereas if you look at FreeBSD or Illumos, it's a bit more ingrained. You're not really too sure which header is the kernel header, or which is the Solaris header, or ZFS header, and so on. Okay. And I want the autoconf as well, which I didn't want to extract it from the build system of FreeBSD and so on. But the sources themselves are ZFS. There is nothing special. Okay. Uh, just to, s to steal uh, the FreeBSD guys like, a little bit, I think you know they the FreeBSD porting, uh, FreeBSD also has a Solaris porting layer that you know, they probably think is pretty good. So I think. It would be really interesting to try and find like what are what are the things that people think are good about those different porting layers and figure out how do we create like the superset of all the good parts of that when we create an actual independent code repo. Yeah, so, but um, like Apple, they all the structures are paid, mm -hmm. so they can access inside their V nodes and inside mm -hmm. the UIOs and so on. Whereas I, I, I cannot even look inside the structures. I have to pull their API. Yeah, so cool. you would have to make it even more. Yeah. Objectified. Uh -huh. Cool. Any more qu questions about Mac OS? Well, this question for everybody on the panel. Uh, do, do you use any uh, tools for like static code analysis, code categories, that sort of thing? <coughs> Even that most of code is internal. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Can we hold that for the next round, just so that these guys can can talk about their development models first? Um, Chris, can you tell us about the Lumos development model? Yeah. So Lumos, we kind of hinted at earlier, has advocates who are the people with commit access or push access to our GitHub repo. And the model is basically you get reviews on, we have a ZFS mailing list, ZFS at Illumos.org, I think. And you get reviews there and then you send it to a list of advocates to say here's who reviewed it. And assuming that you got it reviewed by people who, so for ZFS changes, if you got it reviewed by Matt or George or some, you know, it's a domain expert, then the advocate will push it into the, into the repository. Um, and so gener generally what happens is, you know, if Matt or George makes a change or if someone at Joint makes a change, then someone from the company goes, goes through that review process and then it gets pushed into uh, Lumos. And we've had a couple, I think some FreeBSD changes came back. We don't, there's no one really actively pulling things from other distros uh, or the other OSs. So, but sometimes we got some FreeSB, FreeBSD changes because I forget who, but someone from FreeBSD actually got the most dirty. Yeah, no, Steven's been working on that. Yeah. And I mean, we have, in general, for ZFS commits, we have rules about, kind of unspoken rules, but you have to run all of our test suites. So sometimes when someone who does, who's not familiar with ZFS development, but just ports a change from another system, um, I've generally been willing to use like Delphix's systems to run the test suites for those people, so. All right. Is that it? Um, yeah. So, uh, any questions about the Lumos development model? Do you guys have any system for managing versions or, or releases of your port, or is it just the, a constantly moving? The core Lumos doesn't have any versions or releases. It's up to different. If you you fork it and then you have your releases of your so Joint has releases and Delphix has releases, but the core Lumos is just a, a just a trunk that changes whenever, you just branch whenever you want. Yeah, the, the core of Lumos, unlike, say, a FreeBSD, is not a full distribution. Right. So it, you can't build a FreeBSD distribution on its own. Um, but we also take great pains to make sure every public committed interface stays stable. Um, so we're, of course, the ZFS, unfortunately, the kernel app is not part of that interface, but that's part of the Um, Shin, can you yeah. tell us about the development process? On so we, we have uh, about four active, active developers working on uh, the FreeBSD port of ZFS. And um, so the, uh, I, I think the development uh, model is pretty much like the Linux guys. Uh, we cherry pick 
change from Lumos and um, we do some casting and and then we commit to the to the previous the SVN repository. <coughs> we are still using SVN. Um, yeah, and, and we are looking forward for a, a centralized uh, open ZFS repository. So in FreeBSD, um, just how can you kind of, who is involved in doing the porting process and reviewing process? Like, uh, uh, I guess, like, uh, Brian was saying that you know, they really review, like, every change from Lumos, like, really, really carefully, um, and then, like, go through this whole testing process. And it's like, what, one, you know, maybe somebody from the community does the actual port, and then Brian reviews it and commits it. And, and tests it. So how does that? How do those things? Well, happen? it's like mostly it? peer review. Okay. It's um, so uh, we we send the send the change set to 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 our ZFS development uh, analyst and get get things reviewed. Um, but sometimes, uh, due to manpower limitation, uh, some some changes are uh, committed directly. And then if somebody um, has a change. From the FreeBSD community that they want to get into free, uh, into FreeBSD, you know, ZFS on FreeBSD change. What's the process look like for them? Um, so it's not a change from Lumos that's being ported from Lumos, but a change like that's so originating on FreeBSD. Well, you, you, usually, um, if one gets committed to to FreeBSD, uh, it, it will get some 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 sort of uh, review. Uh, that's that, that's our commuter's rules. So basically, you, you seek for review from, from someone who is familiar with the code, and then um, you commit the change. Great. Um, question, questions about the FreeBSD process? Are there test requirements? Like, you know, in Lumos, we have the test suite. Um, has that also, is that also available on FreeBSD? You know, you guys have some regression testing too, right? What's, yeah. what's the test? rigor that's required for like ZFS changes, whether it's pulling from another, um, you know, from upstream or a, a new commit from a, a developer? Well, we, we run, uh, we test the ZFS <coughs> test week, uh, and sometimes we also run some, uh, our, our file system exerciser. It's a, it is available in, in a source tree. That's like a ZPL, uh, you know, ZPL positive. No, no, no. It, it's, a, it's a generic file system exercise. Okay. So it tests uh, uh, every Vino uh, operations right. and, and do several iterations with uh, multiple threads. Cool. So on the Linux side, we run the test. Um, we also run a bunch of test suites for Linux that we've tried to cobble together over the years. We run XFS tests. It's kind of the generic Linux file system stress tests. Um, we actually run the a test suite, a Polyx test suite that came from FreeBSD originally. We don't run the ZFS test suite, um, which I really would like to run because that's kind of a big hole in our test coverage at the moment because it tests more like the ZFS IOCTL interfaces or like send, receive, that kind of stuff. So I wish we had more coverage there, but we do run all that stuff in every commit. So. Um, Let's maybe take the, you had a question about um, static analysis, um, or someone had a Oh yeah, I was just curious about the tools in general uh, uh, for uh, code analysis and uh, measuring code cal test calculations, mm -hmm. that maybe, maybe uh, you use but uh, I don't know. About. So we've run certainly Coverity and Clang, I think, are two pretty well you know, known set of code analyzers on the Linux port. And they found a lot of stuff, but it's a lot of false positives usually. And we just haven't had the manpower to run down all the false positives and get it reporting the code clean. <laughs> I'd like to get to the point where it does do that and then we keep that you know, at zero, basically. It seems like the most effective way to run those tools, right, is they're mm -hmm. useful once you eliminate all the defects yes. and then you kill anything as soon as it pops up. Yes. Um, but we haven't had the manpower to get to that point. I think it'd be great if we could maybe pursue that through OpenZFS. Mm -hmm. I mean, Clang's an open source analyzer. I'd be happy running that. Um, well, but it has a scan project, which is available open source projects. Oh, cool. Well, maybe they're a good choice too. Um, any, are, are there any other tools being used on Lumos? 
Blint, huh? Blint. Does that count? Yeah, you know, it is <laughs> better analysis. It's like it does, it's better than, I mean, I think Lint is in some ways more useful than those tools because like the ZFS code is actually Lint clean. Like, you know, it has to be Lint clean to integrate it. So um, it's obviously less checks than are done by these more sophisticated tools, but um, you know, they're actually all checked. They're, they're all, all those rules are adhered to. Um, any other tools that people, I know, I know um, like for example on FreeBSD there's the uh, lock order, the witness stuff. Um, yeah, then that's the heavy. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's kind of Any other? And there are also certain types of locks inside ZFS that we just cannot check. Like the config locks are really problematic. Because they're kind of implemented their own way. Yeah. All right. They could be. They could be. I mean, that'd be pretty interesting. Feature witness. Witness, witness has been ported out of FreeBSD into user a number of times um, and into other products too. So if it's interesting for ZFS, it might be an interesting thing to have in ZFS. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You're setting me up. Um, <laughs> did you have any other, do you have any like specific side analysis tools that you thought would be good to use? I was most, uh, more interested about like a, a code coverage, test coverage yeah. analysis. Because we given the ZFS to the user mode program, it would seem that it'd be possible to you know, yeah. basically just cook something on it and see if, what's what's the coverage there. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know that we've ever done that on Linux. Has anybody? I've, I've looked at the bullseye. Yeah, I've done bullseye on the Z test. You have? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, last time, well, last time I ran it was probably a year and a half ago. Or so. Okay. Well, that'd be very interesting to see what we actually get access. I'm sure the coverage is very low for Z. Yes. But, <laughs> why? Well, maybe. What is Bullseye? How would you say? So Bullseye basically is a preprocessor that, um, depending on whether you're doing stuff for like FAA certification or so multi-decision coverage or single decision coverage, whatever, basically it, it um, injects instrumentation points and then catches those as you go through different decision points. And so it can tell you basically, if you run a test suite against the program, how much coverage you've got. Is this an open source project? No, Bullseye's not. Bullseye's not hugely expensive though. I think Coverity is also a commercial product, is that right? Yes. It's, it's pretty free to set up for open source stuff. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, let's see. How are we doing on time? Um, are there other questions that we want to get answered from this from this panel? I think what's a pain what what is the biggest pain in the neck? for the distribution that you care about in terms of ZFS, ZFS integration, whether it's code or pulling downstream or interacting with other parts of the community or what is it and in particular with an eye towards what how we as a community can help. I would say there's a couple issues on the Linux side. Um, Linux suffers from <coughs> a few problems that FreeBSD and Illumos don't, or a few more restrictions I guess, not problems necessarily. Um, things like stack size are much more of a concern on Linux. Um, I don't know. How memory management is done is totally different than the other platforms. So people will make changes upstream in Illumos that are perfectly reasonable on FreeBSD or Illumos, but they're just non-starters on Linux. We don't control the entire environment, so we have to live within the kernel, and the restrictions the kernel imposes, we have to follow. So that code will change in Linux. So it would be nice to maybe socialize some more of those relatively minor restrictions upstream so we don't have quite as much churn in our code. Cool. Uh, Jürgen? Uh, biggest pain points? Probably the lack of knowledge on <coughs> how Darwin works or yeah. how Apple. This doesn't seem to be that much documentation on okay. the internal. So. So I don't think that's really probably something that a lot of people here can no. help with because yeah. we aren't, you know, Apple experts. But um, yeah. other things, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's one of the main things. So we have to do. I'm finding Vino create the most of all the, mm -hmm. the uh, because they have to be given all the information up front, the type and the, what we call the V data, the FS node, the field. Mm -hmm. That has to be given when you create it, and like FreeBSD can pre-create nodes. And, assign them later and come to that. 
We don't have a good memory system either. We were wondering if we should uh, take the Linux's slab mm -hmm. allocator to stay if you use Darwin's own. We, you can run out of a certain size. Mm -hmm. Let's say a 64 byte size, way before the kernel's actually out of memory, mm -hmm. which is quite frustrating. <laughs> yeah, so. And I have no way of detecting yeah. whether or not it's going to run out. So, it, you, well, you find out when you panic. But <laughs> <laughs> so, those are the things we're fighting. In terms of what people can hate, help with here is um, we still got to do the on-exit stuff. Mm -hmm. Not really entirely sure how that works, but it would be nice to kind of just get it explained so we can do our own version. Yeah, because again, we can't set the SS node. We have to presumably build a table or something. Cool. Biggest pain points on Illumos? I don't know that. Well, how hard it is for other people to push things to Illumos, basically. I think <laughs> it's not necessarily a pain for for me, for me or you, but it, in yeah. general for the community. For the community, yeah. Probably not that great. So. Cool. Yeah. I, th uh, sure. I think big, the biggest pain, uh, pain point is uh, some some missing features on FreeBSD, like the. Um, uh, the scheduling class on uh, Boris that um, allows you to uh, cap the CPU utilization mm -hmm. of a certain certain kernel thread. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we we currently worked around that, but um, I don't think that's a sustainable solution. So we we still need to find find out way to to fix that. Are there other pain points from FreeBSD folks and the result? A lot of people in the room. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it's a pain point, but on FreeBSD, more, uh, because ZFS is included with base FreeBSD, mm -hmm. I see more and more users in the FreeBSD community want to run ZFS on and run all ZFS systems, mm -hmm. and so you know, we're getting more and more uh, users, and over time, even integrating uh, ZFS into the that sounds like a good problem to have. <laughs> Lots of yeah. people using ZFS and wanting to use it more in the, in the different situations. So. Cool. Um, other questions for the panel before we kind of move on to what an open ZFS code base might look like? Cool. I'm going to have to steal my laptop back from you because I have slides on there. Thanks a lot, guys. So um, I put together some, oh geez, it's not, here's the, um, so I put together some of my ideas on what a, what the concerns are with the platform independent code repository. Um, and I think this uh, touches on a lot of the points that uh, that were just raised. Um, so first of all, like what, are, what is the point of it? What are the goals? Um, so all this is stuff that people have just mentioned. Getting, uh, simplify getting the changes into every platform. Um, simplifying the slurred supporting layers that exist on different platforms. Um, I don't know about, the, I haven't looked at the Linux one, but I know that the FreeBSD guys have complained about like how ugly the Solaris porting layer on their platform needs to be in order to take in ZFS changes from the Lumos without um, modification. That you know, there's crazy things where it's like, oh, there's a function called like, you know, a CV broadcast, and it broadcasts a condition variable, but it does it a little bit differently than the way that the Lumos one expects it to. So you have to like do lots of nasty hacks with like include uh, with header with the C3 processor to say like. First, you include the ZFS header, the ZFS header file, which you know undefines uh, things and then calls other things, so that you know CV broadcast means one thing when you're in a ZFS file and another thing when you're in the rest of the kernel. Um, you know th things like that. Um, and uh, you know, the I think the overall goal here is to get to a point where all the code that's in this open ZFS repo can be pulled by all the platforms without any local modifications. Um, you know, this, 
this is probably a stretch goal for the day one, but I think that's kind of the eventual end, uh, end goal. So um, you know, what are the requirements for the code that would be in this uh, repo? So I think first and foremost, it has to be, test it has to be well tested. And um, so it needs to be, we need to be able to test it on any platform and um, have reasonable confidence that it's going to work well on every platform. Um, so one way of doing this is to make sure that it can all be tested in user land um, because you know, POSIX tends to work pretty much the same on uh, every different platform. Um, so uh, the idea would be to basically have like a libz pool, expand the libz pool so that we can test more and more of the code in user land. Um, and create, uh, yeah, so basically, and create a like, not Solaris, but uh, OpenZFS porting layer, which um, each platform would, uh, would implement their own, including Lumos, and then including uh, the, us the you know, POSIX user land version of this, that would be part of the code repository. So um, yeah, today, you know, a lot of the code can be tested in user land, um, mostly like the lower levels, like the SPA, the DMU, some of the DSL and the Zap uh, are tested by Ztest, but that really leaves a lot of things uncovered. So like send and receive, um, ZFS diff, ZFS allow, all of the actual user land code, like libz, lib ZFS and like the ZFS command line, um, the ZFS IACTL layer, like none of this code is tested by Ztest today. Um, so I've, I've started some work um, to be able to exercise all this stuff in user land by um, creating like a shim so that when uh, you know libzfs does an ioctl, it's actually going and talking to another process that's running libz equal. Um, so the idea here would be to get it so that we could run the whole test runner test suite um, in, in user land against libz equal. Um, and that would be able to run on every platform, hopefully with like basically no modifications. We just use standard POSIX APIs. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the, the kind of first bar would be to get um, everything, all the code except for like the ZPL, the ZBall, and like VDEF disk because those are really not platform independent today, or at least not entirely platform independent. You know, the, Z, the ZPL is very different um, on you know Linux versus uh, FreeBSD. Say. Um, so one question that I had is like, it seems like every platform has different make files, so we need to figure out like. What do the make files look like for this uh, independent code repository? Um, you know, we could just like the easiest thing would be to say like, oh, take everything that's in a Lumos and like plunk it into another code repository. Um, but like the make files on Lumos are very heavyweight, um, obviously because like they can compile like everything a million different ways. You know, use the land kernel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so figuring out like what to do there is kind of an open question. Um, so, um, I, th I think uh, one of my one of the ideas would be to codify all of the interfaces that the ZFS code is using. So rather than just you know today, um, like we make changes in the Lumos and we just like use whatever the Lumos interfaces we want, whatever interfaces is, is, exist in the kernel, we use them, and then you know, if that code compiles uh, into libz equal, also then we'll add like a stub in. Um, in the libz equal, you know, kernel that H or whatever. Um, so the idea would be to say, no, you can't do that. You can only use interfaces that are defined in this, you know, one header file that's like ZFS, uh, you know, ZFS kernel interfaces, ZK, whatever. So you know, we would um, create our own, like, you know, mutex enter, you know, kstat interfaces, kmm uh, allocation interfaces, you know, everything. And then you know, these would all be like a uh, macros or you know little small little functions that wrap the interfaces on each platform. So um, the tricky thing is figuring out like which of these interfaces should be included, and then what are the semantics of these interfaces. You know, because we've heard from Google that like um, you know condition variables exist on every platform, but they work a little bit different on every platform, right? So I mean, for condition variables, I think you know it's so pervasive that we clearly need to stick with the, um, the semantics that are used by the ZFS code today that came from you know, Solaris. Um, but for some of these other things, 
uh, I think it's more kind of up for debate and discussion of like how do we make it so that uh, we get like a superset, uh, so that we use a minimal set of interfaces that can actually be implemented easily on every platform. Um, right. I think I touched on these other things. <coughs> so here's a couple of specific examples. Um, so uh, on FreeBSD, they explicitly um, declare uh, tunables um, using this uh, syscuttle macros versus like on Illumos, uh, we just like declare a global int. And then um, you can modify that uh, int you know, using the tools on, uh, on Illumos. So this is kind of a very easy thing that we could just say like, okay, all the code in the repository, you know, you want to declare a tunable, you use, you know, a macro that's like ZK for ZFS kernel interfaces, syscuttle, whatever. And then on FreeBSD, that's just like a pass through to, you know, syscuttle UPod. And then on other platforms, you know, if they don't have the, that infrastructure, then it just declares the global variable. Um, another example is like, uh, you know, on Illumos, we use this CV time date high res with this special condition variable, and like this doesn't exist on any other platform. Um, so, you know, creating like a, something that logically wraps this, like, you know, sleep until this time. And then, you know, on Illumos, maybe we do this. On some other platforms, you know, maybe they have like nano sleep or something like that. Um, does this kind of make sense, at least, what I'm proposing? All right. So, um, there's a ton of open questions here, which I'd like to get you guys input on. Um, one of which is like, what library should be included. So um, you know, when we compile uh, in userland today, like libzipool, um, you know, it, it depends on like libnvpair, libavl, libumem. You know, all these are interfaces that also exist in you know, the Slayers kernel and then in like the porting layers. So when we create, if we create this independent code repository, should the code of these libraries also be in the code, the um, OpenZFS repository? Versus, should these just be dependencies that um, you know uh, that it's up to each platform to make sure that they have it? You know, so in other words, the code in the repository just has a make file that says you know dash l mv pair, and then like you know it's up to you to make sure that like that's in the path uh, up to each platform. Um, opinions on this? I don't know, like what uh, you know. Keeping keep 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 keeping things more. Loose uh, will allow things to flow quicker. So the so a lesson learned from FreeBSD as opposed to uh, the is that have everything very tightly coupled is very convenient for sort of your downstream, but it's painful being a person who's keeping everything together. So uh, so you think loosely coupled is is better from your point of view? Yeah, it'll it, it'll let things move quicker. So I. Uh, I like. I mean, that's uh, that's cool. I think one the the flip side the flip side to that is that um, it makes it harder to change those interfaces, right? So, like for example, I added a bunch of stuff to libnvpair that's used in ZFS, like the fnv list stuff. Um, that wouldn't be at, like that would be much more difficult if those were in separate code repositories, right? So, so it, it might be a kind of thread that when you pull on, it, you start pulling in a bunch of stuff that. So yeah, we yeah. want to pull it. Right. So you might like, down, like, I think we'd, we'd already be saying, you know, just kind of walking this forward, we'd already be saying, okay, a Lumos community, either, you know, RM minus RF ZFS, which would be tricky to have like, an, I mean, we already, it's, you already, I mean, then you can, you can boot the thing. We already say it's not really a thought. I mean, I don't think that we're saying that any platform is going to like RM their code. They just pull it from here. Sure, out. sure. So then, or, so then you're saying, okay, so then, this really doesn't get modified yeah, except okay. for when we're pulling yeah. it. So then to include other ancillary libraries would be yeah. would then what do you yeah, do you also say, oh well you do you don't make me in your own local yeah. live so, in here, you so, have to pull it from Yeah, it means we're like raising the Jolly Roger over the UMAP. Yeah. Which yeah. is definitely not gonna work very well on any other platform. Okay. Or or in particular on Illumos to just yeah. say like, oh sorry, you don't own your allocator. Best feature. Yeah. Yes. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I totally agree that on Illumos, like we already have these things, and so it's fine. I mean, on other platforms, like what? How do you implement these, or like where do you get the code for these libraries today? 
So on Linux, things are a little more complicated because every distribution does their own thing. So we have no control over what versions of these libraries get installed on them. So we've actually kept them in tree. So we have a version of like libnvpair, right, that we build in the kernel and then we build it in user space as well. And that's the only same thing I can think to do on Linux, just because we don't have control over that. And we could ship our own versions, I suppose, but you want to override the one the distribution provides? No, probably not. <laughs> so you, so it sounds like from your point of view, you could kind of go either way. Like, if these were provided in the in um, OpenZFS repo, then that would be less work for you because you just pull it down. Yeah. But if they weren't provided, then you just kind of keep doing what you're doing today of like keeping the code for you know the pair in the Linux ZFS on Linux repo and distributing that with your. We certainly need to keep a copy of some of these for the kernel, right? So the kernel side of this, where they use, we don't have ABL trees or any of those, so they're not things that exist in the Linux kernel. So either way, we're keeping a version of them. So it's kind of weird to keep two copies, right? So we just build that yeah. on both sides. I, guess, I mean, my only concern, so uh, my only concern with keeping, with not keeping in the tree is that then like Linux, you know, you guys have to have your copy of all of the libnvpair, the libumen code. And then FreeBSD, like if they are doing the same thing, then they also have to have their own copy of that. And then Illumos has its, its own copy of that. Yeah. And, you know, maybe yeah. this is not a big deal because they are changing that quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. One other thing about some of these uh, additional libraries is that, for instance, FreeBSD has talked about having an NVPair library that's BSD licensed that can be used elsewhere in the kernel. Mm -hmm. What we really need is just the expectations of how that library is going to be used. So if the interface is well defined, then we can make our ND pair implementation uh, have all the features necessary to support whatever comes from OpenZFS. So it sounds like there's at least rough consensus that these should not be part of the um, OpenZFS code repository. Well, perhaps the interface should be. Yeah, I think, I yeah, think, so think the, the, yeah. the map files, so you want to have the Yeah, the so the interfaces there. would be part of you know, this, uh, you know, ZFS kernel interfaces. Um, you know, and maybe we make an exception for like, these things aren't prefixed with ZK or whatever. They're just like, you must implement all of libnvpair.h, you know. Does that, that's kind of what you're saying. Well, right? actually, you want, you want the map file more than the pair file, because the map file defines the actual public consumable interfaces. So. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. it doesn't define like what the function call arguments are, yeah. but. Yeah. 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 But changing that, can't really change that without breaking the library. Yeah. Anyway, so. Cool. Um, all right, so then there's also a bunch of questions about like what are, you know, if we create this independent code repository, then, you know, we need to figure out like what are the rules around like how we, how we make changes to that code repository. So, you know, what testing are we going to require? What code review are we going to require? Um, you know, how do we decide like if, if it's, do we, is there some kind of, any kind of like usefulness um, requirement? Like. If, uh, if I have some change that's only useful on my platform, then like, you know, do I push it upstream? Do I not? Um, and, you know, kind of what's the, the process? Like, what, what tools are we going to use? Who do you talk to? Um, and um, I think probably one of the things that we could easily raffle on is, you know, how, how do we document the changes? So, um, you know, for example, like, uh, do we document with, like, with a bug report as we do on Lumos? Today, um, or do we document it with like commit comments? As um, you know, I know like on Linux, that's really heavily used. Um, do we use like commit notes, which is like a fancy Git thing that is like comments, but lets you actually modify it after the fact? Um, which is kind of like one of my beefs with the comment-based system. Um, so let me just propose. And, and, and answer some of these questions, and I, I certainly don't mean to dictate this. This is totally like um, we should figure out what works best for the entire community. But just kind of as a starting point um, for the discussion, um, I would propose that we kind of s stick with the Illumos model of code reviewing, meaning that everything must be code reviewed by somebody who is not the person who implemented it. Um, the changes have. The changes should be tested in userland and in at least one kernel. Um, there should probably be relatively few committers, uh, you know, at least initially when we start the project. And the committers would be responsible for making sure that, that the code is adequately reviewed. Um, and uh, you know, 
they would be expected to also be available to do some of that code review. Um, and then to document the changes um, in bug reports. Um, so, so what, um, how do people feel about this? Is, is this completely crazy? I know this is like different than other platforms. I just have a question. Yeah. Um, so if I'm just like kind of an average Joe who's working on CFS, mm -hmm. is the idea that, you know, say I'm doing it on Linux or Linux, do I just push it to, to that source repository and then someone from that community who's basically <coughs> We'll push it up to the OpenZFS repository, or do I push up to the OpenZFS? I think the idea is that you push directly to OpenZFS. So no one can ever. So does that mean like maybe yeah. paint the picture then, but just back backing up you have to be like, what? Where do we want to be? Like, what's yeah. the ideal world? So the like ideal world, the, the ideal ZFS, OpenZFS development experience would be like, uh, let's say I'm on Linux. Um, it, that's why I'm using my desktop. I care about my changes getting into Linux. What I what I do is I um, you know create my diffs against Linux, and if they're only touching uh, you know, this, the files that are part of OpenZFS, then those files are identical on, on, in the Linux uh, code base as in OpenZFS. So I create my changes, I test them on Linux, then I, um, I guess, maybe, maybe what we would need is some way for you to actually check out the OpenZFS code repository, make your changes there, and then like, um, apply those changes like automatically to the, uh, like basically cherry pick them over to the ZFS on Linux code repository. So you can compile both the, Linux, the ZFS on Linux one for the kernel and then the open ZFS one for user land. Test it in user land using the, you know, ztest and test suite against the lib z pool. Um, at least make sure that it like approximately works on, uh, in the Linux kernel. And then you, you would, send out a review request to the OpenZFS mailing list with the diffs against the OpenZFS code repository. Somebody would review that and then integrate it into the OpenZFS code repository. And then ZFS on Linux would pull that change into the ZFS on Linux code repository. So that, that kind of perspective, that kind of procedure is very similar to what somebody de developing, like if you're developing on FreeBSD today, and you want to get your change onto every platform, you kind of have to do all the same things, except that you're dealing with Illumos rather than yeah. um, OpenZFS. Okay. Um, then I guess what happens then when we have changes like NFU that will straddle the boundary? Like I'm working on a platform like, like yeah, I mean, I need to change both an interface, you know, under, underneath it to fix a bug and inside the source code. I mean, like what happens when there's basically a flag there between the, yeah. the porting layer and, and like, so I basically need to put it something goes into my kernel which is not obviously specific to my kernal and something that's above, you know, in the ZK layer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, are people, realistic, are people gonna have local changes in their distribution still yeah. before pushing out? I mean, I think, uh, at least initially, people are definitely gonna have local changes yeah, in their yeah. um, I'm just wondering, I'm just kind of wondering what the end goal is with yeah, that. I, I, think, like, I think along those lines, another area where you may have local changes is the usefulness factor, right? Like it may only be useful on one platform, so it never makes it to OpenZFS because. But, but I think that those changes would be rare. I mean, given the scope of like, you know, we aren't including yeah, the ZPL. Like, it's pretty. I think it's relatively rare that you're going <coughs> to see changes that are actually not. They might only be useful in one particular use case, which is more common on a given platform. Like, you know, maybe it's really useful for desktop stuff, and you know, Linux is really heavily used on the desktop, and other platforms not so much, but. If it's like, if it's still useful, at least a little bit on the desktop, then I don't think that there's a problem with getting those changes into the common repo. Um, I think that dealing with like flag days between, you know, basically between the ZK layer and the, the uh, and the OpenZFS code repo, they'll be tricky. Like dealing with you know flag days from any other. Uh, I mean, between the, any other code those bases. happen now, right? Anyway, except the Lumos doesn't see them. Everyone else. Does. Yeah. And it's an accident because we call something that they don't have in their reporting high right. yeah. 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 That's what we're work out how we yeah. deal with that. So, so I think like in, in reality, like each repo is going to be lagging a little bit behind the, the common repo, um, just as they lag behind the Lumos today. Um, but hopefully, the idea would be that they would lag less so behind it because they would have been involved in the code review process from day one. They would be able to you know, know that it's only using supported interfaces, so it isn't going to break when you pull it into um, each platform. <laughs>
So I guess from my perspective, the only thing that I don't like about what's proposed there is changes documented in bug reports because the changes then are hard to see downstream. So it's coming from OpenZFS into FreeBSD, then into a product, then into a, a release notes to a customer, and what happens if the bug tracking system is down or disappears or, uh, or whatever. And so that's the main reason why I would advocate for having the documentation in the actual changes that are distributed throughout all the downstream consumers of OpenZFS. Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely a legit concern. Um, so my, uh, the thing that I don't like about the documenting stuff in the comments is that they can't be changed afterwards. So like if somebody said, if all the documentation lives there in the comment and it says, oh, I'm making this change, I did this diagnosis, I figured out that this is the problem, you know, and you've written like, you know, the whole book on this. And then later on you discover, oh, that analysis is totally wrong. That guy did not understand what he was doing at all. It's like, well, too bad, there's no way to change that. Well, no, actually, I think that's that's really useful because yeah, when I go and look at it, you know, with my new perspective, I'm like, that guy had, was just full of bullshit that day, yeah. and that actually tells me what informed all of his changes. So yeah, that's really useful knowing what his state of mind was on that day. Yeah. No, definitely, but but then I can't add my state of mind to correct him. But it's not that you want to delete it, right? Yeah. You want to say all of the above was wrong. Here's my real analysis. Of the yeah, I'm not saying like that we should delete what that guy said when he was making it. It's just like, you know, I want to be able to add like. You did not understand this, how that interacted with this part of the system. Like, this is why your changes actually work, or whatever. It's, it, it's not to protect the, the guilty, it's to be able to really chastise them. Sure. <laughs> so, um, I guess it depends on what revision control system that you decide to use. Um, but there are revision control systems that allow you to change the commit message in the, in the, in the, in the future, right? I'm going to propose that we use GitHub. Git and GitHub. Um, and so, another, like, something that I think theoretically um, would address all these concerns is Git notes, but I don't know because I've never used them and I don't know like how they get transmitted and you know it's more of a big unknown um, because I don't think that any of us is using not, them right now. Yeah. But, but it does allow it would allow those changes to come along with the commits <laughs> and also to change them and I, I you know annotate them later on. So just, let me just see if I understand the, the kind of. Xanadu of where, where we're going here and, and if this actually solves problems. So is it that like, first, let's say I'm some just some user and my distro is two versions behind on ZFS. I can just, you know, get clone, build the thing, drop it onto my kernel, and there's a chance of it working. Yeah. Like that's that's one place that, that kind of we hope might work. Yes. Um, and the other is that um, this this repository has like works on all platforms and doesn't have, it isn't quite, is, is not just the same pain in the neck, but now also for our limos, but somehow over yes. globally less of a pain in the yes. neck. That is the idea. Do people okay. buy that this is possible? I, I think I should be very skeptical about it actually. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to get there, but I think maybe the scope <laughs> of the changes between the platforms is underestimated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they're fairly extensive on links, and they go deeper than people would like to admit. I mean, the core is the same. But I don't know about the other platforms, but on links, things have changed. <laughs> can, can you kind of elaborate on that a bit? Because I think this, the specifics there uh, would be very interesting. So, for things like the, the core that aren't in the POSIX layer yeah. or aren't in those other interfaces, those we tried to avoid changing as much as possible. They're style things, they're you know, memory issue things, things like that. I'd say the, the deeper changes are on the fringes. They're things like um, <coughs> changes were made to libzfs to accommodate how Linux manages block devices in the user space, right? How it names them, how it creates partitions, and there's stuff like that. So that might be actually uh, uh, another area that I, that we need to elaborate on is like, we probably should separate out libzfs into like, the libzfs that's dealing with like creating mount points and device files and like all that crap, uh -huh. put that in its own file, make that part of the ZK interface, and say each each platform implements that independently. I think we could get there, but it's going to take a lot of rounds of refactoring the code to figure out what's common and what's really not between the platforms. But we can probably do that now because we've got five implementations, right? We can see what's common and what's not. Yeah. Um, and we start refactoring Alus as it currently is, and then. I mean, I so we get to the point where. Yeah, so I mean, part of to jump forward a few slides, like how do we get there from here? I think 
you know, we can do this incrementally. Like we can do this by either like working in the Lumos code repository to like add this ZK layer and like tease things apart, or we could, you know, we could just create a new repo with the files identical to what's in Illumos today, and then you know work on refactoring in there. Um, the idea being that like today all the other platforms are pulling from Illumos, so if we just take the code that's in Illumos, put it into another repo, like then every, it's the same for everybody else. It's only more work for Illumos, um, you know, initially, and then until we can kind of get to this nirvana of everything is better for everyone. But it sounds like yeah. you. I'm kind of hearing two things. One is um, we have a lot of local, like we have a lot of local changes in uh, in Linux that it'll make this really really hard. But then also there's not that many changes in the core that is actually what's being targeted for this. So I think that's probably fair. I think most of the major changes are around the edges and not in the core. But I could be forgetting something. <laughs> is that true for FreeBSD as well? I mean, do you guys have changes kind of? Throughout, or mostly in. The so there was a concerted effort made in the current portability layer, layer to try not to change the code at all. So we might have a few scattered hip tests in some places, mostly because like the interface of the ball layer is not well defined. Mm -hmm. But that could be fixed in OpenZFS. Yeah. So uh, I don't think it'd be that hard. Yeah. I guess the one thing for us that join is that very often all of our changes to ZFS interact with some other subset, other subsystem of the kernel. So a lot of our work goes with into containers or zones. So um, I mean, for us, it's just kind of a question of how do we actually, you know, if we're going to be creating new ZK layers or like are all the interaction with containers actually, you know, two Illumina specific since yeah, I, I know there's LXC, which is maybe mainline of jails have their own stuff, but. I have no notion of what those APIs are. I mean, I guess for us, that's kind of one of the big questions is how do we, for us, a lot of our innovation work is so where we straddle multiple components of the system as opposed to kind of keeping it yeah. independent. So how does that work today? Like, so on FreeBSD, like, does the ZFS stuff that integrates with zones on Lumos, like, is that hooked into jails on FreeBSD or do you just like totally ignore if zero that stuff all out? I'm not so familiar with it. Package yeah. So, so, so okay. uh, I, I think all, all of the zonal functions are mapped to map. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to think of what was outside of the ZPL. I mean, yeah, well, I guess we have a lot of functions. We're slowly working on pushing up the IO throttling. Uh -huh. the, the limit stuff will integrate also with zones. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of kind of IO kind of collection, like case stat work, which is based on per container basis needs because you can also have an arbitrary collection of ZFS volumes available in the So the core needs the concept of a context that the yeah. IO is done. Right? Potentially, yeah. I mean, right. I, guess, I guess for us is that we, we, for at least us, and I don't know about other folks, that there's always that kind of different integration with other aspects of the yeah. system. So for us, it's not always as clean as just saying, we, as we don't work on core ZFS as much as we work on integrating ZFS with other aspects of the system. So. For us, it's more of a question. Of so how you're going to have to do a lot of work on like helping to define this ZK layer, right? Well, that, that's all the things that are important. How do we, yeah. how do we well, better maybe do Maybe that's an outstanding thing to go just investigate and report back to like how feasible is that going to be? Yeah. And like, I mean, obviously, the first step, like, we need to go enumerate what all these interfaces are and be like, oh, well, you know, they're this on this platform, this on this on this other platform, and then like, you know, merge all those lists of requirements <laughs> together. Uh, on Linux, does it uh, does the zone stuff hook up with uh, Linux containers? Not at the moment. We haven't even explored doing that. But I think even just that fact that it's used on two platforms like means that it should probably be part of the common repo. Sure. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm just saying, kind of in general, we have those kinds yeah. of those interactions. I'm just trying to yeah. Things are how we actually. I guess for us, one of the questions is actually how do we add to the zk layer? You know, like yeah. realistically for us, it would be like we'll add it in our tree. Yeah. We'll probably push that to a Lumos, and then maybe that'll eventually make its way up to the general stuff. Because if you're adding new interfaces, then someone's going to have to go right for Linux and FreeBSD yeah. and macOS. Well, I think it'd be nice to provide the NoAuth version. Exactly. Yeah, I think you have to, sure. the thing is like if you're adding to the ZK layer, you have to provide the implementation for user land, which in in a lot of cases is going to be the NoAuth implementation. Sure. Yeah. So hopefully, it's easy for other platforms to pull that no-op implementation from the user land into their kernel, and like it's not a big deal. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I think that the idea should be that it should be relatively lightweight to change the ZK interfaces. I don't think that we want this to be like a 
set in stone, you can never change what, what interfaces we need. I just have a question about, so you mentioned like using GitHub or whatever, and that solves the, you know, what SCM do we use, and it also solves the, how do you review changes? So it's a common thing that everyone can use. <laughs> yeah, so um, let me uh, get to another, <coughs> let's, let's go through this slide and then get to a slide that talks a little bit about what you just mentioned. So okay. um, you know, we'll also need to decide like, what what kind of non-interface uh, level, but like <coughs> constraints we need to apply to the code. So for example, um, you know, Linux has these smaller stack sizes. Should we just say like, uh, in OpenZFS, you have to assume that the stack is small, and like maybe you know when we do when we run it in userland, we explicitly uh, create small stacks so that that's actually tested. Um, you know, kind of going to the lowest common denominator, the you know, creating the requirements so that it'll actually work everywhere, and you don't unexpectedly break Linux. Obviously, you know maybe we're leaving some formats on the table on other platforms, but probably not that big of a deal, right? Like allocating memory is pretty pretty cheap. Um, you know, what language should we use? Um, C99, except for on Linux, uses C, uh, C yeah. like 30 <laughs> years ago. Um, you know, what compiler um, should it be compiled with? I think like we're gonna have to support uh, multiple compilers, but um, you know, what kind of make, what, what make files do we provide to compile all this stuff in user land? Um, what kind of stack analysis tools do we use? So like, Lint, um, or you know, adding in other of these um, cool stack analysis stuff. Um, other kind of like requirements, like um, you know, we talked about FreeBSD's witness lock ordering stuff. Um, you know, it would be really cool if we could actually make it witness clean, you know, and explicitly document what things uh, don't work, and uh, actually have that be checkable on any platform with like a user line implementation of that. Um, you know. So, uh, Sorry, the stack thing, um, is it possible under Linux to mark some threads with a larger stack? Um, the reason why I ask is because in FreeBSD we had a small stack forever, and it winds up becoming one of those things where you start thinking about the environments more than the programming. And I, I know you're supposed to think about the environment in which you're programming, but it becomes one of those things where it's a constant, like, do you remember how much stack we have, do you remember how much stack we have, and it's, can be, um, it's, it takes up a lot more time than people think. So, so uh, on, on Illumos, our approach to that, or uh, I should say in Solaris, back when I was working in the Sun, our approach was like, well, if you run out of stack space and it seems like there's, like, you're reasonable, you aren't, like, actually doing anything stupid, then just bump up the stack size. But that, you know, that's, the problem is that this, this may apply to, like, all, th like, all threads in the system can oh, call yeah. into ZFS, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, those, you know, I, I had definitely had the idea here of like creating bigger stacks for threads that are owned, that are owned by ZFS, like the you know sync threads and ZIO threads. Like maybe we could do that on Linux, but we probably can't go change like the size of every thread in the entire system. So, so the deal on Linux is no, you can't. The kernel provides no interface for right. larger than eight stacks at all. Well, you, you can't even need to rebuild your kernel, or we need to invest the effort and engage with the Linux upstream community and make a patch that does that. I don't know that they're strictly opposed to it, but it's been attempted in the past and failed. Small so. stacks are really cool. Small stacks are awesome. You can run a ton of threads. It's great. Programming with small stacks is not so much fun. So it's interesting. It's, 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 yeah, it's not our decision, basically, yeah. right? <laughs> so we have small stacks. So we, we have to live with them. There's going to be so. things like this where it's like you know one community, like one community has a constraint and like they can't change it, and we we kind of have to decide like. As the larger ZFS community, like, are we going to like take that burden on collectively, or are we just going to say like, no, like, screw you, like, stack sizes are at are you know one meg, and if that doesn't work for you, then that's your own freaking problem. Could, could we also could we also do some horrible like if def magic around it, or or macro magic around it? Like, oh, I hate that. For, yeah. like, for, for you, you get you get something on the stack, and for you, you get to camera malika, and I mean, usually I can do both or either. Yeah, so Perhaps maybe. We haven't seen like any real performance concerns from us moving stuff from the stack to the heap, which we've done a lot of in the existing company. I would say that was maybe the majority of our changes to the core ZFS code. <coughs> it's moving stuff to the heap. It doesn't, it doesn't impact performance that much. It's just a different way of coding. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that was kind of my uh, experience as well with like doing some of these changes is that like, you know, the, the slot allocator is really fast. So 
it's not that big of a deal. I would say the more insidious problems we've had with Stack and ZFS are there are a couple places where it's recursive. That kills us when you go do like a mm -hmm. traverse DP oh, yeah. ZFS where recursively go down 12 layers until they're like yeah. 300 bytes on the stack. Like, you don't do that. So are you, are you able to fix that by allocating stuff on, by keeping it recursive but allocating it on the heap? Yeah, okay. which is dirty. We don't like it. But well, it, it's, you know, what we had to do, yeah, otherwise so it doesn't work. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, it's less dirty than like <laughs> un making it non-recursive, which is you know, yeah. Like I don't think that it's that dirty to say like oh you know like you you're putting a block pointer on the stack that's too much so you know can't allocate. It. Like, it's not the end of the world. So it's, it's what we did, but I'm good to I hear other people with similar issues with that. <laughs> um, all right, so getting to some of the issues of GitHub, so. Um, our proposal was basically to use GitHub for uh, storing the code, um, but not necessarily use all of GitHub's uh, aspects. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different things that GitHub can do, like you know, code review and bug tracking. But we don't necessarily have to use their version of it. So, um, you know, like for code review, it's really like nice and easy to do it on GitHub. But um, you get the like you only see the diff style. You can't see like the changes side by side, which is I think really critical for big chunks of changes. So, to go back to my previous question, so I wanted to just ask a question about the previous slide. Oh, all those sorry. items that you had. Um, so you can catch some of these in, in the review process, mm. but often it's the dirty. Uh, does it build? Does it work? What do you have a, a slide where you know do you, do you have an idea that there will be like a build farm of all the platforms that no. anyone pushes a change we build and no. test or what, what's your I mean that would be great um, to have, but uh, my like my idea is that we make it so that when you build it in you like you build it in user land, you test it in user land. And we constrain the user land environment sufficiently that um, we know that it'll work. We know we have high confidence that it'll work on other platforms. So, you know, for example, we restrict the stack size in user land. We compile it with the right flags in user land that are the superset of everybody else's flags. You know, we do the um, lint checks. We do the witness checks, like all that stuff. Um, I like personally, I feel like setting up that um, build infrastructure is like it's really beyond the scope of like what I have time or expertise to do. So if you would like to do that, that would be super I mean, awesome. I I started doing some of this stuff that I have systems like tying into GitHub and using Jenkins so that when you do pushes, uh, it yeah. does check outs and build and integrated tests. So and I've seen other projects have like kind of like distributed Things mm -hmm. where, like, I have a platform and I'm interested, so I, you know, contribute some resources, and then there's some interfaces where, uh, you know, uh, like on GitHub or any of these things, you can have post commit triggers, which then trigger some of these other things. And so I mean, it, it is useful to have some of that because yeah. otherwise, if you don't, you're relying on review, and so you know. Review a lot of things, but say if someone contributes something, but you don't know if it breaks the mix for like three months, and then that kind of thing. Yeah. So. I mean, I think that would be great. I I don't think I mean I don't think that that's a requirement for getting for starting this project. Okay. Um, how do other people feel? Like, is this a, is this a critical piece of infrastructure that we need? I think it's fine for not getting started, but it'd be really nice to have to be able to take a dip and just push it to the cloud and say, build this and test this for me so I don't have to set up yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, like, we've set some stuff up locally for that, but it'd be nice to have some official website. I can point to you and say, hey, I tested this, look at the, it passed or failed, instead of me just saying. Yeah. Um, uh, are there any cloud providers here that might be interested in, uh, in like providing infrastructure to well, Amazon? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
we, we, we can talk about it. Yeah. The bigger challenge is not the, the VMs themselves, but the orchestration around yeah. it. Yes. Yes. So, thanks. <coughs> so GitHub has an API for all that. When a pull request comes in, automatically run yeah. it. Send back you, a green, you, yellow, you, you, you can. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we have some folks that joined who've done that with Node.js, but GitHub is also pretty janky. Like, you will drop will drop messages and things like that. So, uh, Another thing to kind of just think about is that if we want any kind of pull or post receive hooks, um, yeah, we'll, need to, we'll need to have a, I mean, we can still use GitHub as kind of the, as the main thing, but you might want to consider having it repo be somewhere else, yeah. if that becomes sort of necessary. Yeah. Um, just, you can't add it there. Yeah. Uh, Definitely. I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert in this area, so like I welcome lots of input. Um, you know, we, bug tracking we could use GitHub, or we could use like uh, Jira has a free for open source thing. Um, we have, we could talk about that. We have a number of open source free apps that we're doing. Okay. Uh, Craig does a lot of this good stuff. So. Cool. The like build farm stuff. Uh, or? Building, testing, but bugs, everything. Um, I think that's about all that I had. Um, I think we're almost at time for a break. Is that right? 11? Okay. Um, so, you know, how do we get there from here? Like, this, this is a lot of stuff to do. Um, we can't do it all at once. So, um, I think the idea would be to start with. Um, I'd like to propose that we start with just like creating an independent code repository, putting this, putting the code from Lumos into there, and then um, you work on reducing the diffs and creating the zk wrappers. So, um, you know, for example, like uh, I guess this is actually a, a kind of a question: like, should we work on reducing the diffs in both directions? Like, should we say start convert like converting the Linux? stuff to use C99 in these files so that then the diffs are smaller when you do like a switchover or should we just say like that's fine and you know Linux will you know Linux can pull from this repo and um, you know kind of work on reducing their diffs on you know on your own schedule well I, I said this, this is going to be this is from an independent repo this isn't going to go anywhere without someone really pushing it, and the person who's going to push it is going to be someone who has a problem that this solves, right? So I think, you know, we need someone who's going to own all the logistics of setting up GitHub and, and, and uh, you know, kind of any notification and code review and all the, just the process associated with it, and then maybe finding, um, it sounds like we're kind of tacitly volunteering um, a Lumos. What, what we need is like two distributions to get married in this repository, yes. right? And like we have a willing bride in Illumos, and we're looking for a suitor yes. in Mac OS, FreeBSD, or Linux. Yes. So I mean, that's, whoever's that's willing, totally to, yeah. 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 Or whoever's yeah. willing to get that on me and like <laughs> devote some time. <laughs> or, I hope my girlfriend is not watching this. Uh, <laughs> or we might need a bigger dowry first by making some of these. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I think more the ZK yeah. changes. It's actually yeah. like worthwhile. That, that's right. Uh, we, we are definitely things. willing. We're, we're kind of offering up our, our herd of cattle in the form of, of a dowry, and we're looking for a suitor. I think we pushed that one about as far as we can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 The files you think should be the same in two different in Illumos versus another repo, and figure out why they're not the same, and then reduce those differences. Is it by, like, by, is by, much by e adding these wrappers? By adding the wrappers, it's a necessary. much easier place to start because then you can you can get to the end. You can get to a point where you're like, here are the twenty files that go into the common repo, and they're already the same, so we can immediately start pulling. Because otherwise you're in a weird situation where some people are pushing these ZK wrappers to mm -hmm. this central repo while we're still pushing, I guess, other like, changes. like mm -hmm. big important changes yeah. to the most that people, that the other distros are still, like FreeBSD is still pulling, but Linux is trying yeah. to use both our, like it, it seems like you have a really, we should have one upstream that like stays the same for a while until we're close. I think there's a safe point yeah. to switch. Otherwise, I feel like there's going to be moving the changes around is going to get much harder if we have kind of 
we're pretending this, this is an upstream, moment. but it's not really upstream. Yeah, I also think it seems like, given that we're not certain of what's going to be in the ZK wrappers, it'll be a lot easier for us to actually go figure that out, actually get that working yes. on the different platforms, and get that in all the trees before we then try and separate out into something else. All right. Because there's going to be a lot of work in creating this, just getting it to build and run. Mm -hmm. That's going to take development mm -hmm. effort that I feel like we can't stop all other development effort to try to get the user land thing working here. Gotcha. Yeah. <coughs> So, um, so wait, are, 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 are we saying we're, we're, we're not going to put a repo up on GitHub to begin with? I think that's, that's, that's the, what's currently under discussion. Oh, okay. yeah. Maybe we want to have a dowry first. <laughs> so so, so I, I, I agree there's a lot of problems, but putting a repo up on GitHub in what, whatever state is in is so cheap that I, I can't what, what, imagine. What value does it add us? Right, if we're going to actually have a separate repo, then we actually need to be dedicated to doing all the work in that repo, and everyone has to pull down from that repo. And given that no one is going to match that repo, or track it very carefully. But like, we still have a constant stream of changes going into the limos. Mm -hmm. If you create a separate repo and start making some changes there, it's just going to get out of sync with all of the actual features yeah. that are being added. I guess the trick is, how do we make this a willing ride? If this is a willing <laughs> ride, then she should show her virtue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what it's out the repo and be you know, the first yeah, downstream consumer. I, I mean, I, I, I did kind of assume that uh, it Lumos was going to do it first. But. I mean, it's not like if we. If we got with Lumos to just say like sure, like all Lumos processes apply, but you just some files live in this repo and some files live in this other repo, and like everybody else can take from whatever repo they want, like we could do that. Uh, I guess the point is it doesn't add a lot of like value unless there's somebody else who's gonna say like okay, we're gonna invest in this and we're gonna you know pull from this common repo and we're gonna like make our changes so that yeah, you know. So I think the the benefit of actually doing the separate repo is saying, yes, the Lumos is serious, right? The, the, the rules for interacting with this particular repository are these rules, which are slightly different than what they are for a Lumos. And yeah, we've done the separation, here's the flag deck. That invites, because um, it's probably not gonna be just an individual, like in the FreeBSD community, that gets to, has the time to go through and work on the ZK porting layer and all that kind of stuff. It's gonna be a whole bunch of us. But there's a, you know, the commitment's been made, the, there's a place that you can point to that says this is the repository where that work happens, and then we can work towards actually having a portability layer that, that means that FreeBSD can pull uh, easily from, from this separate repository. So, so is it enough of an enticement to say, look, Illumos is going to pull from this, you know, as Matt said, just kind of have some files live on GitHub, and other files live, I don't know where they are, but somewhere else, maybe also on GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and basically just business as usual. Is that enough of an enticement? Because I don't think anyone wants to do a lot of work in terms of separating out a, a porting layer without a real target, without knowing either it's FreeBSD and it's solving FreeBSD's problem, or it's macOS and it's solving macOS's problem. Like, still, you know, we still, we wanna make sure we're building a bridge to somewhere. Well, I think that the biggest issue with upstreaming stuff from FreeBSD is just understanding the workflow and, and all those kinds of things. And so I see you know, it moving to GitHub and having these new rules for how you interact with this repository and all that kind of stuff as laying the groundwork for how uh, the FreeBSD community can interact better with that repository and actually make these things happen. So that's, I think, the reason why I find it compelling that there be a split, even if it's just a Lumos that's pulling from it uh, to begin with. Uh, because I think that very quickly that, that situation would change. Just because you, you have documented, hey, this is OpenZFS, here are the rules of the game, this is where you do your work. Do you find that a compelling argument? That makes sense. It seems like what we need to do then is separate from other this from other operating systems in a limo, in a limo, figure out a way to have something to break out something that ignoring you don't even need the zk layer at all just break out something that's independently testable and start making the process go through there i mean i think you, you know, even to, to your point like it, it doesn't need to be completely independently testable from day one because the idea would be like you just take you know the, the changes 
the Z these ZFS files live in the OpenZFS repo. We pull them into a Lumos, we test them on a Lumos, we do everything on a Lumos, and then, you know, that's great, right? I think that's a good start. Yeah. And Rob, would that be, I mean, I know that you're concerned about the interaction points, but I think it would be hard for us, but I think we'll have to talk through and work out the details there. Why would it be hard for you? I just, for example, like a bunch of our changes, we're changing like zone.h, and at the same time, you're changing something in ZFS.h. So it's going to be hard because you have to do a coordinated putback across the You're going to have to do the coordinated putback not just to open ZFS, we have to make sure that what you put into a Lumos matches the changes in the rest of the system. So you have to figure out how am I going to actually, so like for example, for us, we're just going to push to a Lumos join. Same way people are going to push their products repository at first. I mean, it's generally what folks do because what? Everyone doesn't want us to just put untested changes, but yeah. we want the same time. Yeah. So then for us, what we're going to have to do is figure out how do we actually break that into two separate, because we're basically going to have two components that live in two separate repositories that don't get updated at the same yeah. time. So I, I just don't know so, how that's going to logically work. So yeah. we do that in Phoenix. <coughs> so we track FreeBSD, but we have our own, we clone it. Yeah. And, 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 and we clone FreeBSD and we do our work there. So if you're worried about double commits and things sliding past each other. Well, it, it, the, the, question, the question is, the question is what happens to the ZFS module? Does ZFS become a Git sub-module, strictly speaking, in a Lumos at some version? Or does it is it its own copy of it, the code? Because then, if it's its own copy of the code, we have to deal with basically pushing two different changes, which are actually physically different. Like, yeah. for us to test these things, we're, we, like, the user line stuff is kind of okay, but like, we have to basically, for us, most of the testing is basically, we, we have a huge multi-tenant system, like, and, you basically need to have these coordinated changes with the rest of the, the rest of the kernel. It's not an independent change to just ZFS. So basically, you have these codependent changes between the kernel and ZFS. And how do we make sure that when we have a separate repository for us, at least, like, how do we coordinate those changes? <coughs> I, I mean, we 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 do things like this, not uh, but uh, uh, sort of across different facilities in Phoenix. So I mean, sure. we, we I mean we like what? Sorry. For example, for our, for instance, our our build and everything like that. So our GUI will use certain features of the kernel, and we we just can't have it out of out of sync. So we manage the uh, changes to actually both systems. If we were to keep them all together, uh, we wouldn't be able to maintain the separation that allows us to track FreeBSD better and track. We, we do something well. very similar at Delphix, but and I'm sure that they do something very similar at Julian, probably with a different. You know, pile of repositories like Node, for example. But I think what we're saying here is that now you've got something which is logically in a single repository that you're using to build your product, and you have to take that and split it up into two upstream integrations. And more important, the, the ZFS changes that if I want to push them to, I can push them to Open ZFS easily. But if I need, but Open ZFS can't pull that down into a Lumos without additional kernel changes for it to work correctly. Yeah. So the question is, how do you actually do those coordinated changes? Yeah. For oh, I see. The difference yeah. is that like. What, what, what everybody has today is like code base A, code base B, code base C. All the code is different, and all these like one is for you know the kernel, one is for user land, one is for the GUI, and there isn't any code that's like this the same copy of the code in all these things. But now we're saying that we're going to create like OpenZFS, and then Illumos has a copy of the OpenZFS code checked into it, yeah. right? So and just in. the way free, you know, like you could say FreeBSD has a copy of the Illumos code checked into it, right? But what, um, what do you do with KVM? Okay, then we have our own, if it's its own independent module, it doesn't have any other dependencies on the system. So, I mean, it, it just uses the standard kind of DDI and doesn't need anything. Because this ZFS repo, the goal isn't that you check out both repos and you need both repos to build, right? It's that you take what's in the ZFS repo and put it into the, yeah. right. so you would turn this into it would still be two pushes, but one push would have everything, and the other push would have only the ZFS changes. Well, but if the goal, if the the goal is that you do the first push to open ZFS, yeah. and that gets yeah. pulled down into a loop, yeah. so now I need to yeah. coordinate that when that merge work. happens yeah. and get those extra changes. So like when you otherwise, like the build breaks. Yeah. yeah, like when you pull it into a Lumos, if there's changes to the ZK layer, then like those will have to be implemented in a Lumos. Right, but it's it's there's a, but, but, but those need to be done first. So, so, so I don't move past this. But then as is, well, I, I guess I'm just trying to understand how this is any different than I mean. You're feeling our pain. Yeah, no, right? This yeah. is exactly what happens at FreeBSD or Linux or whatever. And so, how do we actually make that easier for us in general? Rather, how can we not all suffer? <laughs> how do we, rather than increase the suffering for everyone. Because like, here, it's strictly, it's going to be strictly harder. Like, it, for Illumos. No, I think well, it's well, actually harder, harder for Harder for Illumos and no easier for everyone else is what you're asserting. Yeah, yeah I'm well, sure certainly the, 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 like, the first in, step. In the first step, yes. Well, it, it always has to be a merge now. 
it's not going to be just a copy of the place. Sure, yeah, I, I agree. Okay. So I'm, I'm still trying to understand why that's harder than... Uh, I guess if you're only working in ZFS, it's fine. But when you, if, as we start doing, okay, we can just move on. It's fine. No, no, no. So I think what you're, what you're, I mean, most of the work that is happening in other communities with ZFS is just in ZFS, right? We're not talking about into plugging in FreeBSD ZFS with some of the facilities in our VFS layer. We add enhancements yeah. to the case stat stuff. I mean, we, there's certainly coordinated things that have to happen in FreeBSD, but it's done as a merge down from here, lost the other bits, commit to FreeBSD. So I don't, I'm just trying to understand why this is. But are, are those freestanding fixes on their own? Like for example, if you enhance case stats, you can push that independently. And I, mean, I think what Rob's talking about is like pieces that don't work without the other. You well, like the portability layer that's inside FreeBSD, right? That doesn't exist in Lumos. So oftentimes we have to enhance that. That is a coordinated change. I got you. It is a merge down plus fixing the portability right. layer and commit it once. Sure, but wouldn't you do that in Lumos as well? You would commit to OpenZFS, you merge them into a Lumos, just like any downstream consumer for the operating system, plus fix up your portability layer, plus whatever else you need, and then one commit into Lumos. I mean, I think Rob's point is that that is like that is strictly worse than what they do, what they have to do today, which is like there's just yeah, one repo, and you know, Lumos is going to absorb some pain. I don't disagree. I'm just saying for us, for the majority of our work, it's going to be extremely difficult to work. And not all of my coworkers are this. That's nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so one of your coworkers is less nice. <laughs> well, I mean, right now, right now we have a lot of people who really want to contribute to it, but it's there's a lot of confusion. So um, about how those changes are going to go in and, and and what the process is. So I I, I think there's going to be some pain all or, around. It's really like opens up um, a process for many communities contributing towards it, and we'll, I think we'll see a lot more changes that are. Um, very good. Well, what, yeah. what if we took a different approach, which is there's going to be an upstream, and then how Lumos manages that upstream is up to Lumos. So, for example, if if they want to say, um, you know, we're just we're just going to pull, we're not accepting kind of you know um, integrations into these files, then that's one way of managing. That's what we've been talking about. It. If they want to say, look, Lumos is just going to manage a bunch of you know deltas from the parents. Then that's another way of dealing with it, and it, it's going to be a different kind of pain. Either you know, and each community can kind of make its own choice. Right? We, don't, we don't have to. I think there are kind of two independent, um, you know, trains of thought here. One, how do we create this central repository, and who's going to work on it? Who's actually going to go do some work there to make things common? And then there's an independent conversation about how the different districts are going to use that, or not. And you may decide that like. Um, to foster stuff that's coming from join it, that the Illumos community will manage their push into OpenZFS. And you guys just continue to push into, sure, yeah, into Illumos. Yeah, we can, right. we, yeah, exactly. we can figure out what makes sense for right. us. I don't want to. No, that's fine. Yeah. All right, um, I think it's about time for a break. I think you know maybe the one thing that we should take away from this is like, what, what can you do? Like, how is this going to help you? And what can you do to help make this happen? Um, you know, because I think as we've seen, like, this does not do much to help Illumos, right? Yeah. It only helps Illumos if we get more changes from other people in other communities, right? Um, well, it, it helps Illumos specifically by making sure that um, we don't all wander off yeah. in our own directions, you know, doing work independently and end up with, you know, Z, Z pools on Mac OS that are mutually unintelligible with Illumos. But th there's no, like, the short term, yeah. it, short term it is, uh, all, you know, pretty much just paying for Illumos um, versus, you know, some of the other communities, I think short term it can be uh, more help than paying, right? Is the main good thing for getting purchases from other people that they don't have to build Illumos, basically? If yeah, they can build and test, yeah. Build, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you guys, it's like 11.15 now, let's just so maybe we should just do a do, do, do break. Do a quick break now. All right, cool. Thanks, everyone. There's two pastries. We're going to take them away. Yeah, exactly. It's not a different make-up. It's a different make-up.